The Libertarian uh, State Convention, California State Convention, was held uh, last weekend, or actually the, the last weekend of April, uh, in Long Beach, California, and uh, the uh, governor's nomination ended up being quite interesting, Tyler. Tell us a little bit about that. You were there. <laughs> so, it started off, we had a, a bit of a debate between two governors, uh, or governor candidates, uh, which was, uh, the debate was, was hosted by um, Larry Sharp. Um, and that was the day before. And uh, obviously at the uh, following day, we would have done more Steve one uh, candidate, which would either be uh, Zoltan or Wildstar. And somehow someone made a motion to endorse both candidates. Well, it uh, reluctantly passed. Um, and then I was a little upset about this, so I, I tried to uh, motion, or I had some people who we tried to motion to repeal that motion, and it failed, and we tried again, and it failed again. Um, to get kind of more my personal belief on this is I didn't Well, but the, later on, there was a separate nomination, right? Yeah, we, we, there was a separate nomination. So there was the, what happened was we divided the question, uh, and that was allow us to endorse them individually, and we were able to endorse uh, Wildstar Unanimously, uh, and then Zoltan with a little bit of, of uh, push against, but ultimately he was endorsed as well. Uh, to me, I, I would rather have an either or uh, candidate endorsed. I don't have a, uh, I'm not stating a particular preference on which one, but I didn't feel it was appropriate to have both uh, candidates endorsed for the same position. Simply, we want to you know, put all of our resources and effort on one candidate. Uh, and, but there was some disagreement. Some people believe that. We need to accept everybody here, and uh, um, you know it's top two system anyways. It won't matter, and that we should just endorse both candidates. So, so what ended up is that, in, in effect, both candidates were endorsed. I yes, both candidates were endorsed. Uh, so actually, we, we even worked with uh, Wildstar to actually help change that, that, overturn that. So even Wildstar, one of the candidates, was helping us, uh, you know, go around to kind of uh, caucus or lobby some of the people at the convention to. Overturn it. We got some support, but then because the question was divided, uh, the support that we had was only enough to divide the question, not enough to actually uh, prevent another candidate from being endorsed. And I feel that I didn't talk to uh, Zoltan what his uh, thoughts are, but I imagine, given his personality, that he probably would have preferred to have a single endorsement as well. I don't think either candidate wanted to uh, be endorsed with each other. They wanted to have uh, the endorsement for themselves, and so it was kind of a. Uh, Last base place trophy can have deal. Well, the, the uh, I mean, you can look at it from two. You can put a, a negative spin or a positive spin on it. The negative spin, of course, is the Libertarian vote uh, in the primary as well as in the general vote in the primaries, which is what counts here, will be split somehow or another, or more more evenly split, presumably, between Nicholas Wildstar and Zoltan Eastbahn uh, with the double endorsement. Yeah. You know, the, I, I, and as upset, upset as I am with, with, with how that outcome, I, I, I I'm going to put it behind me, and uh, we'll look at the bright side. Is, is at least we have two different, uh, you know, so, you know, types of candidates to attract people in. So it, there is still definitely a good, good thing out of this. I never look at anything as completely negative. Uh, while I oppose the uh, the original or original motion, you know, it's, it's that so Well, it's the positive spin on this is that it is a top two primary. Uh, regardless of party, yeah. exactly. theoretically, it's, theoretically, it's, theoretically, it's possible. You could have Zoltan and <laughs> East Va Zoltan East Va and Nicholas Wildstar coming well, together what, what, one and two. Wouldn't, or wouldn't that be the, uh, the day that we, we were able to get two libertarians up, up well, and be the only candidates? So you have to choose between libertarian or libertarian. Yeah, so I mean, there's probably going to be two Democrats, but uh, you know, at some point, and, and that's the thing is that the, the Republican candidate is hoping that the Democrats uh, split the vote and so that they get get into the top two because theoretically. I mean, with Los Angeles and San Francisco, you could basically have two Democrats on the on the ballot, and we're, once again, we're a one-party state, mm -hmm. very similar to a communist state. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I go quite that far, but uh, but pretty very close. close. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's let's co compare and contrast the the two candidates while we're talking about them. Yeah. Uh, how would you uh, describe the uh, the Wildstar candidacy? So I feel that Wildstar has definitely got a very um, humble approach. So he, he's uh, maybe not as bold as uh, Zoltan, but he uh, he comes off as very personable, very humble. Um, you know, always smiling. You know, I, that's one thing that you don't see a whole lot of a lot of candidates. He's, he's always smiling. If you can see that smile, um, 
and, and, and people generally support him as a person, not him as a person as a candidate. So you can have a very obscene views, but because they like him as a person, he's a very approachable person, people are, are resonating with him uh, really well. Whereas uh, Zoltan, uh, um, he's got a little bit more uh, uh, firm approach, and which is, is pretty good because he's got the uh, more confidence. Uh, and we need to have a confident candidate. To, to uh, you know, uh, to do this is, is to have a someone who who can actually do the job. You know, it's interesting. Uh, two different very personal stories. Uh, Nicholas Wildstar is a black kid from Milwaukee that uh, moved to California 12 days after he graduated from high school to follow his dream in show business. He became a rap artist. Uh, it's uh, cue ball is his rap artist uh, moniker, and he's got some stuff on on, on uh, YouTube and, and he's produced a lot of music and uh, performed a lot of. Uh, rap music, uh, and uh, he had a day job too. And back in on Martin Luther King's day in 2017, he was walking to the bus in the pre-dawn hours to catch the bus to go to work, and uh, was stopped by the cops because he looked like somebody they, you know, some robbery suspect that they were looking for. So he was stopped, and the only real resemblance between the suspect and Wildstar was that they were both black. <laughs> but uh, Wildstar did not particularly like the idea that he was being stopped, gave him a little bit of lift, talked back a little bit, and was arrested for resisting arrest, don't you know? Yeah. Isn't it weird to have that to be your only criminal offense is resisting arrest? And <laughs> last week, uh, last week of April, uh, in a trial jury in uh, solid Republican Orange County, solid white almost Orange County, he was acquitted by a unanimous verdict by the jury. So he, he went up against the man and he won. And he was, you know, probably lucky he, he was handcuffed and arrested rather than shot, but anyway, he, <laughs> yeah. he says that, yeah, they thought I was only arrested. <laughs> yeah, only arrested. Uh, the other guy, Nicola, or, uh, Ozoltan Eastman, also a very uh, interesting story, son of uh, immigrants from someplace in Eastern Europe, I'm not sure where. But uh, he uh, is a futurist and a uh, transhumanist and has published uh, in that field, written a book in that field, uh, has been a reporter for National Geographic uh, Channel, has uh, been a uh, war reporter in uh, Kashmir, uh, and has done a lot of really interesting uh, media things over the course of his career. He's also a, a successful entrepreneurial uh, real estate investor who, who's done very well in real estate. And uh, Stanford, I think it is, uh, you know, degree. Uh, so, you know, he's uh, got a lot of intellectual firepower. So you've got kind of a, a yin and a yang going up against uh, each other. Two very different styles, two very different uh, approaches, but with, uh, with but somewhat similar ideologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do put, find that a couple of things, even with uh, Zoltan's uh, campaign, would be pretty interesting with the, uh, the federal land uh, grab or, or the uh, dividend that he talks about. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of the media was labeling it as a universal income. Um, and, and if you talk to him directly, you'll find out that it's not a universal income that he was proposing, but it was kind of mislabeled that way. Uh, but it's basically just giving everyone capital within uh, land that the government owns. I mean, we, we, the whole point of having a capitalist society is that we can own capital uh, and use it to better, better uh, our, our lives and stuff. But so many people in America, in America have zero capital. I mean, they, they have money, they have debt, but they have no capital. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this is really a, more of a federal issue than a state issue. And of course, you run yeah. the state office. But, but the issue is interesting because a, a, a large percentage, I'm not sure exactly what the percentage of, is, of California land is owned by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the land is also owned by the state government. In Nevada, it's something like, I don't know, 80, 90 percent of the Oh, yeah, if you look at it, that, the that, the, all Nevada is completely gone to the government. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the government, let's, let's face it, not a real good steward of the uh, environment or of the, of the land. They, you know, they don't make the highest and best use of land for the most part. Uh, nor do they do that in California. I mean, I'm, I'm an avid uh, backpacker and mountaineer. Mm -hmm. And the Sierra Nevada is a great place to go camping and hiking and climbing. And uh, the ability to go on some of the popular routes is a valuable commodity. And I would be more than willing to pay you know, a premium price to climb Whitney or to, or to yeah. climb Half Dome. But I can't. I am pr prohibited from paying a market price for doing so. I am made to get on the telephone on New, on, on New Year's Day and dial like crazy trying to get to be first in line. It's a queuing system to get to, to use some of the more popular out outdoor resources. This is a, a situation that's crying out for a market solution as opposed to uh, essentially a socialist uh, stand-in-line government queuing solution. 
and yeah. uh, uh, private, privatizing, privatizing some of those resources. I, I go shooting up, up towards uh, Mormon immigrant uh, a lot, and, and it's kind of a, a similar thing. It's, it's government-owned land. Uh, thankfully, um, it's completely unregulated, so people there, there's no rules or anything, regulations as far as going up there. But the place is a mess. You got bullet casings all over the place. People are shooting down the trees and everything. Uh, it would be nice to have maybe uh, maybe a private land uh, control where they were able to you know you know keep make, make sure people are safe and not shooting at the campsites or anything like that. We need to have some you know private regulation, not federal regulation, but private regulations with that. I like to look at the big picture with with federal land because because basically uh, the, the federal government really is the American taxpayers that own all that land and. And they're doing uh, a, a really underwhelming job of managing that land. The last time the government did anything good was really the the uh, the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam makes money. It makes a ton of money. It was built with federal government money, and it makes a ton of money. But lobbyists get involved, and uh, big corporations get involved, and there's a long history of the government giving sweetheart deals to mining companies where they they lease them, you know. Uh, five square miles to mine for a dollar a year and uh, or they'll lease land for lumber for for a, a dollar a year for per acre or something like that or you get and, the other extreme and the government says nothing can be done you know you're sitting yeah, on top of a gold yeah. mine and they say no no you can't touch this oh, land yeah yeah but it's been a long dark secret that a, a lot has been done and, yeah, and, and yeah. big corporations have made a lot of money yeah. off of government yeah, land, absolutely right and the government's just not a good steward it's kind of, it's of kind the of one, one extreme or the other yeah it is one stream or the other of the people depending on which politicians right. are, in, are in charge so exactly you know, the green environmentalists yeah. or the yeah. capitalist uh, I, uh, I do believe it's, it's theoretically possible for the government to accidentally do something good, but they never intentionally do something good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's, been, there's plenty of examples we can point to, and that's probably the only examples that social center reference are, are the accidental times where the government stumbled upon doing something good. <laughs> um, in South Korea, we've had a really, really interesting, I guess, one year in the last, the last year of... Uh, the history of North and South Korea and the relationship with the United States government. Started out with Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un uh, yelling at obscenities at each other and calling each other fat and lazy and uh, incompetent, whatever. Rocket man. <laughs> Rocket man. I mean, they were, they were just insulting each other in tweets and uh, uh, official North, Viet, North, uh, North Korean Communist Party manifest. I mean, it was, it was crazy what they were doing to insult each other. And now, North Korea and South Korea had an unprecedented meeting in the DMV, demilitarized zone, DMZ, demilitarized zone, and have agreed to cease hostilities, at least in, in, in part. Are we looking at a rapprochement and an end to the Korean War that uh, would uh, be, and, and could you draw a line between what's happening there and, and, and Trump's uh, 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 zing in this? Yeah. All right. Well, um, I, w I would say that, that uh, definitely the, um, you can't say that Trump, you can, can't give Trump all the credit because... Can you give him any credit? You can give him some credit. You can give him some credit. Uh, in order for them to have had relations that are in agreement that quickly, I feel that they would have to have been talked before Trump had even, you know, entered the pres presidency. So I feel that the, uh, it started a while back, but I do believe that uh, it is possible that you can give Trump some credit for, uh, you know, pushing that work or, or for whatever reason. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that uh, this is probably a very interesting thing. Uh, see, maybe you see some democracy over towards uh, North Korea. I still think that citizens are probably locked up there, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of thought in, in the North that, that Trump is a loose cannon. And, uh, and, and Kim Jong-un does not want to lose power. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to have his military crippled. And even if he was to to win, you know, political favor with the rest of the world because the United United States attacked him, he would he would be hurting because he's already hurting. And and I think that that because he knows that Trump's or at least he believes that Trump's a loose cannon, it has brought him to the table because because in the past uh, with the you know going back to Clinton and Barack Obama and George Bush, it's just it has been just taught and he's just steadily gone down the road of nuclear weaponry. So. Well, do you think maybe that, 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 that part of it might be the fact that uh, the, the mountain where they conduct their nuclear tests is about to collapse upon itself? And <laughs> that, he, he doesn't have a place to test nuclear weapons? The, time, the timing was great on that. And then, but also we have to remember that China, for the first time, started uh, putting some teeth into, uh, 
in the world, uh, you know, when they when they were going to uh, uh, blockade North Korea, so to speak. I forgot what the actual word is, um, but but um, they were not. Um, everybody had been uh, not trading with the North except except for um, uh, China, and then China actually voted with the. Uh, the last resolution in the United Nations, China actually did not veto that um, that vote to put more uh, restrictions on trade with North Korea. So I mean, there was that also happening with uh, with Trump. Um, in the, so I think there's a lot of pressure from both ends from a, a failing economy that's now even their best partner is giving them pressure because the world wants uh, wants to restrict their trade and, and sanctions. That's the word, sanctions. Yeah. Huh? Well, with all of the uh, the Trump threats about uh, I've got a bigger nuclear weapon than you do, that kind of kind of thing going on, uh, and you know, basically threatening to blow North Korea to smithereens. I'm sure that South Korea, Seoul, right on the border, was a little bit worried because yes. they would be the people who would lose the most in any in any uh, new newly uh, invigorated uh, Korean War, mm -hmm. uh, in, both in terms of population that's at risk and uh, infrastructure that is at risk. They would be huge losers, and they've got something to lose in South Korea, whereas North Korea not so, so much. Not so so much big motivation on both sides. Both so, sides of the military. I'm problem. guessing that South Korea probably uh, did some really really strong negotiation and strong. Uh, reach outs to the north to uh, say, hey, you know, we better get this, we, we better take control of this narrative before uh, it's taken away from us, because it is, after all, our peninsula and our and our, our part of the world that's at risk here. Once the armistice is ended, then 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 the South can trade with the north. One of the interesting things that I thought I thought was just really fascinating is when the announcement uh, of uh, an end to the war uh, was was announced, defense stocks. Lost ten trillion, no, ten billion dollars overnight. Yeah, uh, we're talking about Raytheon, and Lockheed, and Boeing, and, and and the rest went down dramatically. Now there is no talk, at least so far, about bringing, uh, to, uh, removing American troops from the DMZ. Uh, and I'm wondering if if that'll stand because I know that the uh, the defense industry they they prosper by having. The, uh, the two Koreas well, as well as after, other parts of the world. That, that, uh, after 50 progress. years of maintaining 50,000 people in a foreign country and all the weaponry and all of the support and all of the, the airplanes and the Air Force and the Navy, that was billions and billions of dollars year after year for 50 years. Um, it goes back to George Orwell when George Orwell was basically saying that, that you need to have a war because because otherwise, how are we going to stay in power? How are these big corporations going to make money? How is Lockheed going to make money? How is General Dynamics going to make money? You know, how is uh, Grumman going to make money? And so, when you really think, it goes back to the Vietnam War, really, in my mind. But because the last real well, war was World War Two, actually. Yeah, so uh, there Korea. was. You talk about bombing and 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 billions of dollars in a war effort to not win. Um, but not really caring to win, I don't think. It was really just to make money. And, and, and that's from my era, that's from my generation. And, and you know, back in the, in the 70s and the late 60s, I, I was in high school back in those days. And, and uh, kids coming home dead, my, my friends on the track team coming home dead. We started digging around, and then we realized the billions and billions of dollars that were uh, being outlaid in the Vietnam War. And, then we, and we started reading George Orwell, we started reading um, where the power was coming from. And so, to me, it's just a reminder that that kind of thing happening is just a reminder to me. And I'm sure somewhere behind the scenes they're saying to Trump, "You can't, ha you can't have peace. We need, we need to keep spending money to support those 50,000 troops yeah. and the Navy around there." I completely agree with everything you said there. I will point out though, because um, the, the stock drop is kind of a placebo effect, just because you know any more people are going to you know pull their money out. Uh, but I forget which, which defense contractor it was, but it was one company that went and told their stockholders that war was not necessary for them to make be profitable. Uh, that, that the, uh, I want to say it was Lockheed, but it could have been another company. Uh, but during, during a meeting with, with their stockholders that they were saying that they had plenty of other, uh, they were going up other avenues to make money. So war is, a lot of people think that war is, is profitable. Well, yeah, it's profitable, but we don't need to have war to be profitable. And even the defense contractors, you know, the defense co contractors, it's, we live in a capitalist society. They know that if we're not going to have war, there's another way to make money. And, and so they, uh, I do think that they'll adapt very quickly um, once they see that the, the president is going to 
uh, or if, if our president is willing to do peace and, and all the other countries around the world are, are, are going to calm down and stop having, you know, trying to wage war, <clears throat> they, uh, they are going to start finding other viable products there and enter other markets. Well, there's certainly a better way to pay, to spend the taxpayers' money than, than munitions and, and, and mm -hmm. bombs and ships and, and uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of people in foreign countries. You know, the, the United States has over 150 um, uh, we're in over 150 countries in the United States with over 400 military bases that we're supporting. It's like millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 I just go back to Thomas Jefferson, you know, trade with all, entangling alliances with none. As a libertarian, I, I just have to be against it. The Libertarian Party was against the Vietnam War even back in the, in the 70s still are against any war that's not declared. Well, speaking of other wars that are not declared, we're kind of playing whack-a-mole. As soon as Korea starts uh, calming down, we're, we're launching missiles uh, to, uh, against Syria, against uh, the uh, a suburb of the capital of Damascus, because of alleged, and the key word is alleged, uh, gas uh, attacks by, by the, uh, the Syrian Ev government. Evidently, we shot off 100 um, Tomahawk missiles at a price of 1.1 million per missile. So that's obviously $100 million that are going to have to be replaced by General Dynamics or some company. So they're still making money. Still making money. And, and, and it may not even happen. What they were bombing may not even happen. May not have. Yeah. I mean, but, the is the key word. But no war machine says, I mean, they, they, this they, is a good they, chance to make they, some money. They shot off the missiles before any uh, nuclear weapons inspection, you know, world, uh, UN, whatever it is. Yeah, it's yeah but now there's a chance to make some money. That's all they care about. And the other thing is our, the Iran uh, nuclear rapprochement, which uh, was negotiated by uh, by the Obama administration, never put into the form of a treaty, so it's essentially an executive order can, can overturn it uh, in, a, in a nanosecond. And uh, Netanyahu uh, of Israel has been uh, putting out intelligence, uh, who knows how reliable it is, but he's been putting out uh, a lot of intelligence or propaganda or whatever you want to call it, saying that, uh, that Iran has been doing nasty things again uh, in regard to their nuclear development, doing it in secret, whatever. All of these things are essentially unprovable, but it's certainly entirely possible for the Trump administration to say, never mind, we're not going to uh, abide by the agreement made by the previous administration, and we're going to do, who knows? Yeah, well, uh, well I, know, I know that the guy that was nominated, or is, but has been nominated for Secretary of Defense, uh, was quoted as saying, we should uh, do a, uh, a limited strike against, a military strike against Iran, take a, you know, a few a few well-placed missiles with and a million a bomb. bomb. Yeah, and I don't really think so. I'm pretty sure that Iran is well, pretty well done. Yeah, I, I know so, and it really isn't our problem. I, I really, I, it is Israel's problem, and, and I think Israel should take care of it. it that's that's if, their if, part if of the it, country. If, it's, if it in fact is a problem, well, then it may be. I don't know. It reminds me of George Bush and Colin Powell going in front of the United Nations, explaining why we need to go to war against Saddam Hussein. I mean, they gave all the evidence of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. And what did we find? Nothing. But it gave us a chance to spend a lot of military money and a lot of might and, and exercise our, our muscle and, and burn up the place and, and now have to replace everything that we burned up. <laughs> so, so it's Halliburton's making a lot of money there and uh, uh, it's just, it's just keeps on repeating. And that's why we need to follow the Constitution as libertarians, as, as Americans, that if, all, if the People's House, the House of Representatives, the most federal the most, uh, uh, would you, we'd call representative part of our government because there's more representatives uh, voting on everything. If the, if the Congress votes to go to war, that means the people are voting to go to war. If, if the Congress is just spending money to make military companies rich, then, then we're going down a really, really bad path and have been. So I think it's really important that that we really need to get back to our roots. And the last war we actually declared, where people sacrificed, where there was rations, where everybody was all in, not just some kind of military expenditure at the cost of some American lives. And so anyway, uh, I, I just think that um, it, it is something that people need to get on top of the hill and yell about, just as we did yeah, during World the War Vietnam II War. was the last war that we World War II was the last declared war. And that's the, the, uh, that's the, uh, the, uh, that's, that's the responsibility of both the president and Congress. The president shouldn't be uh, going to war. Obama shouldn't have been the uh, droner in chief, and, uh, uh, and Trump should not be lobbing missiles into Syria yeah. without a declaration of war, uh, or, or at least you know 
you know, without a declaration of war, and Congress should insist on uh, passing legislation to stop executive action, a war, a war, a warlike action. They should say, hey, there's no declaration of war. Cease and desist. We're removing all funding for any of these kinds of operations uh, yesterday. Well, the spirit of the, of, the, of the War Powers Act was to give the president uh, the ability to defend the nation if it was under immediate attack. And that's not the case with any not of the these things that are no. going on. Moving to a more personal uh, libertarian issue, the Alfie Evans case. This is in Britain. Uh, where they have totally total socialized medicine, uh, national mm -hmm. health care. Alfie Evans, two-year-old kid, uh, in a coma or, or basically who knows whether or not he's revivable. Uh, and the, uh, the doctors, the medical establishment said, no, he's not revivable, and so therefore we're going to remove life support. And the parents saying, well, we think there might be a possibility, and we're willing to bear the expense, or we have other people who are willing to bear the expense, to take him to Italy. And they got the support of the Pope. The Pope uh, and the Italian government got the kid Italian citizenship, and were ready to ha to fly him to uh, to uh, to Rome for treatment there at no cost to the Britons, uh, no cost to the British government. And the British government said, "No, he can't go." Yeah, that was pretty. That, that was probably the the the, the fear of government-run healthcare gone wild. And uh, I don't know how the British governments. They're really going to take a, a political hit for this this happening. Well, I don't know. It happened. The same thing happened a year or two ago with another uh, young child that mm -hmm. was in, in, in similar circumstances. Right. He was allowed to die. Well, it should send a message to the American people and to any other country that has, still has somewhat of a free market um, uh, medical system. Uh, although we're losing ours quickly if we haven't lost it already. When you really look at the collaboration between. Uh, insurance companies, government, and, and, and medical, big, large medical corporations, uh, it, it, uh, it, it's not competitive. I mean, I can go into a hamburger place, for instance, and I can find uh, that I can get two uh, Whoppers for six bucks. That's a pretty good deal, right? And I can go to another place and say, oh, I can get, I can get a chicken sandwich and a hamburger for five bucks. Well, at least I know, because I can look at what it costs. But I can't go into a doctor's office and look how much, is, how much does... Uh, a, a, a test for my cholesterol cost. How much does um, a colonoscopy cost? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, if we had pure disclosure and not just keep it secret from the people that are using medical care, then there would be competition. It would be true competition, and you would see prices go down for the same amount of care. You know what I mean? You wouldn't yeah, have the one, the one kind of uh, a medical care that's not deeply regulated and insured is, is eye, LASIK eye surgery. That's and correct. It's been going down in price. Everything else has been going up in price. Regulation, high prices, free markets, lower prices. Yeah, yeah, and I think this is just uh, this is the scary nightmare of, what, of of how much freedom you can lose where you can't even treat your own child. That's the last word. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Point. Uh, and uh, we enjoy having you.